everyone. It's our pleasure to welcome you to this public forum devoted to the Treaty of Sev 1920 to 2020. Where were we then? Where are we now? My name is Antranik Kasparian and I'll be your moderator this evening. Thank you. So let's get down to business. Our featured speakers today are Richard Hovanesian, Professor Emeritus of History at UCLA and Henry Terrio, Professor of Philosophy at Worcester State University. Both are well known to Armenian Americans and both have considerable experience as speakers, writers, and researchers of the Treaty of Sev. Our hope is that Richard will focus mainly on the historical developments surrounding the treaty, while Henry will emphasize the treaty's present day relevance and applicability. But before we turn things over to our speakers, allow me to state some ground rules. Each speaker will have a maximum of 15 minutes to present their ideas. Following the second presentation, we'll open up to questions and answers, which will last roughly 45 minutes. Given the Zoom format and the large number of attendees, we've decided to accept written questions only. You may submit your questions at any time during the program using the chat function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You may direct your questions to either panelist or to both, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. In doing so, we will screen out questions that are duplicates or repetitions. We also will not accept lectures or rants masquerading as questions. So with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Hovanesian. I consider the most calamitous event in Armenian history. 
the end of the genocide, beginning in 1915 and continuing on through the end of World War I and beyond that. It did require the Turkish government to help gather evidence and prosecute to prosecute the wartime criminals. It did do away with the so-called abandoned properties law, which was a way of legalizing the taking of Armenian properties of deported and killed Armenians and eschewing them to the state. It did do away with conversions of religion since 1914 and a return to their original communities, religious communities, unless they took another decision, an oath to go back to another religion. Uh, it, um, it, it entailed um, numerous uh, points that authenticated the reality of the Armenian genocide. This, I think, cannot be uh, overestimated. It was, in many ways, a culmination of a hundred years, almost, of Western involvement uh, in the Ottoman Empire, reform movements such as the Tanzimat movement of 1839 to 1856, in which equality was offered to all subjects of the Sultan regardless of their religion and uh, station. It was uh, uh, following the treaties of San Stefano and Berlin in 1878, where various guarantees were offered to the Armenians for their defense of their lives and property. It followed the 1895 reform edict uh, following the Sassoon Massacre of 1894, in which once again reforms were promised. It followed the 1912-1914 reform edicts in which historic Armenia was divided in two large provinces with European inspectors general. All of those um, came to not. Uh, European intervention did not cease the Armenian suffering, and the hope in 1915-16 was that the Russian armies, which had occupied much of Western Armenia, uh, would uh, allow for a separate Armenian existence of some kind under Russian agencies. But in 1917, revolutions in Russia uh, caused the abandonment of the Armenian Front and left the Armenians face to face with their enemies. Uh, the Europeans had made all kinds of promises. They're good at that. During World War I, they would, Armenians would not be restored to the blasting tyranny of the Turks that Armenia was entitled to a separate national existence, that the blood of the innocents would not be forgotten. But if I can put my cynical hat on, and it's frequently cynical, the retreat already began before it began. That is, at the end of 1918, when the Turkish Empire surrendered to the allied powers and an armistice was negotiated on, at Mudros, the island of Mudros, on October 30th, 1918. Among the initial um, provisions was that the Turkish armies should withdraw from the Western Armenian provinces, from Eastern Anatolia or from the Western Armenian provinces. The Turkish negotiators were able to change that and to persuade the British negotiator that it was important that they maintain law and order by remaining there. And so the British were happy to get the waterways and uh, their primary interests and were willing to compromise on the Armenian issue. And 
the one stipulation was that the Allied powers held in reserve the right to occupy any part of historic Armenia in case of disorder. Uh, well, there was a lot of disorder with the rise of the Kemalist movement, but the Allied powers never uh, chose to intervene. The first phase of the post-war period was negotiating the German treaty, uh, known as the Versailles Treaty. And during this time, the focus re remained on punishing Germany and putting the Turkish settlement on the back burner, uh, including the possibility of a mandate for Armenia by the United States. Procrastination and procrastination. The Allied powers were not entirely unhappy with that because they were scrambling for more uh, authority and power in the Near East. And so it gave them a little more time uh, to um, uh, set their claims and to negotiate their claims. So the appeals of Boris Nubar and Avidisa Haronian repeatedly that one month has passed, six months has passed, seven months have passed, and still there is nothing that has been done on the Armenian uh, issue. And the Turkish resistance is now organizing. You gave a, a dead um, uh, animal the ability to revive by procrastinating this treaty. We know that treaties historically have been imposed on the defeated side within days, at most within weeks of the end of hostilities, but the Turkish treaty was put off repeatedly. There was a, a lot of hope that the United States would assume the mandate for Armenia, uh, that is a protectorate for Armenia, but Woodrow Wilson himself uh, contributed to the failure of that. Woodrow Wilson, who was a heroic figure for most Armenians, was a very bad politician. Um, he had a Republican Congress, and yet when he went to the Paris Peace Conference uh, at the beginning of 1919, he did not take any Republican, leading Republican with him, and he caused a great deal of animosity. And so he was not a very good diplomat when it comes to that. Um, and to get back at him, when the German treaty was signed with a League of Nations covenant there that would allow a country to take a protectorate of Middle Eastern and other countries, African countries, uh, the uh, Senate uh, rejected it. They refused to affirm the treaty by two thirds vote twice in um, 1919, the second time in November 1919, at which time the State Department informs the European powers that it will no longer participate in negotiating any further treaty, including the Turkish treaty, although it didn't mind expressing its opinions as to what should happen. That left the European powers, the Allied powers, the so-called Supreme Council with the obligation to draft a treaty, and which was already getting out of hand because the Turkish resistance movement was gaining momentum. Mustafa Kemal was already uh, in Anatolia organizing resistance, but nonetheless, the Allied powers went through the motions of uh, negotiating a treaty with Turkey. And those took place between January and April in London and then at the Italian resort city of San Remo. At that time, there was a great deal of differences among governments and even within governments. For example, the British Foreign Office under Lord Curzon wanted to support the Caucasian republics of Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and uh, was very instrumental in getting Armenia recognized along with the other states, and also getting arms uh, promised to the Armenians, whereas the War Department under Winston Churchill did everything it could to block it, and then when it went through to delay the delivery of arms, 
to Armenia, which did not arrive until months after the decision was taken by the Allied powers to arm uh, the Armenians. Uh, and so um, the debate uh, that came up in San Remo in April was, okay, we can no longer have a great Armenian state reaching Cilicia. As a matter of fact, the Armenians of Cilicia in Marash had already been massacred again in February 1920 by the Kemalist forces. So the Armenians are, can't bite off more than they can digest. So we're going to have to have a small Armenia. And the small Armenia has to be a smaller, small Armenia than a bigger, small Armenia. And that is to um, decide whether or not the fortress city of Erzurum should be included in the new state. Uh, there were a lot of debates on that. Nobody would budge on it. Um, Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, had one view. Lord Curzon had another view. And um, Lloyd George was a brilliant manipulator. And so he decided to put to his colleagues in April 23rd, 1920, that why don't we pass the buck? Why don't we get rid of this responsibility for whether or not Erzurum is going to be in the new Armenian state by going back to our friend Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, who is already ill, but nonetheless makes very pro-Armenian statements. So on April 23rd, they decided, and April 24th, they dispatched a request to Woodrow Wilson for the United States to accept the mandate for Armenia, which was already a great impossibility. And I don't know why they accepted, offered that, and why he accepted to the offer to try. And more important was to arbitrate the final boundaries uh, between Ar Armenia and Turkey within the provinces, four provinces of Trebizond, Erzurum, Bitlis, and Vaughan, excluding uh, ipso facto any part of Sepastia, Harper, Dikranager. Uh, what was surprising probably was that Woodrow Wilson accepted uh, the bait and said yes, he would do that. But after accepting the bait, he waited more than two months to organize a committee, a commission, headed very, very sincere commission and very thorough commission headed by uh, William Lynn Westerman, who was very sympathetic to the Armenians, and who drew upon uh, enormous materials about geogra geography, geology, uh, transportation, water flows, uh, and so forth. But they didn't complete their uh, investigation until the second week of November 1920. They didn't, it didn't get to the White House uh, until the latter part of November 1920. It wasn't forwarded to the Allied powers until December 1920, by which time the Kemalists had overrun the Republic of Armenia and forced it to um, uh, cede significant territory like Kars and Ardahan and Igdir and to save what they could save by becoming Soviet states. So the story of the Treaty of Sevres is that in principle it was a wonderful thing and in symbolically it's a very important milestone in the Armenian question to be used for moral purposes and I don't know to what degree it can be used in legal forums but certainly it can be used in moral uh, areas, arenas, and uh, persons like uh, Henry Thoreau, Thoreau and uh, a number of others who uh, feel that there is more to the Treaty of Sevres than I have described are uh, more interesting in that they can give us some ideas as to how uh, a non- implemented, non-ratified treaty that was already dead in the water by the refusal of the Allied powers 
to give anything but lip service to the Armenians when they knew they had a country that was occupied by Turkish armies and were unwilling even to give the Armenians arms to defend themselves in a current time. And so if I sound cynical, I guess I am cynical, but I still um, accept the fact that there is an important moral argument that uh, uh, cannot be taken away from the Treaty of Seven. Thank you, Richard, for your candor and uh, for setting the stage now for Professor Terry, our next speaker. Uh, Allow me to introduce him uh, properly. Our next speaker is Professor Henry Terrio. He's currently Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs at Worcester State University after teaching in its philosophy department from 1998 till 2017. Dr. Terrio's research focuses on genocide denial, genocide prevention, post-genocide victim-perpetrator relations, reparations, and mass violence against women and girls. Since 2007, he has chaired the Armenian Genocide Reparations Study Group and is lead author of its March 2015 final report entitled Resolution with Justice. And in 2019, together with Samuel Totten, Terrio co-authored a volume entitled The United Nations Genocide Convention, an Introduction. In 2017, and again in 2019, Terrio was elected president of the IAGS, that is the International Association of Genocide Scholars. He is founding co-editor of the peer-reviewed journal Genocide Studies International, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce him today, Dr. Terrio. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Kasparian, um, and, and please, uh, I really want to thank the ADL and ARF for organizing uh, this discussion. The fact that more than 100 years after the Armenian Genocide and 100 years on from the, from the uh, Treaty of Sev, we are still discussing this, I think is incredibly important. I think Professor Hovanesian really, uh, you know, uh, gave us some, some real uh, uh, food for thought about the moral relevance of, of these discussions today. And I really appreciate that, that both organizations remain committed to understanding the contemporary uh, implications of, of the treaty and of the arbitral award that Professor Ovenesian uh, referred to and the ongoing issues that we still, uh, the ongoing legacy of the Armenian Genocide. Um, I'm also really honored to be uh, sharing at least a Zoom screen uh, these days uh, with, with Professor Hovanesian, who, in my opinion, has done more than anyone else to increase our understanding and, and, and deep uh, engagement with um, the modern history of Armenia, uh, including the Armenian Genocide and, and well beyond. And I think he's had a role in shaping the very context in which we have these discussions today, uh, which is crucial. He, he has really built a framework for us to talk about these issues 100 years ago that's very productive and that, that certainly uh, could well not have occurred uh, without his dedication and his uh, keen ability to connect the past to the present. Um, I also wanna give thanks to Dr. Kasparian um, who will remember back when we were a lot younger than we are now, um, uh, many discussions about, about issues of, of Armenian identity um, and viability in the, in the future, the, the Republic, Artsakh, and so forth. Um, and, and I also want to thank him for really giving me a lot of um, important ideas that have helped shape my understanding of of contemporary Armenian politics and, and the challenges, particularly in relation to territory and, and reparations and so forth. So, so it's great to, great to be with you as well. Um, I, I do wanna um, uh, uh, reiterate uh, something that Professor Hovanesian uh, did in his talk, which was to distinguish the Treaty of Sev from the arbitral award uh, and, and the process that, that um, uh, President Wilson and his team engaged in to identify the borders and in essence to, to um, mark off the territory that they thought was appropriate 
for an Armenia, sort of post-genocide Armenia, post-World War I Armenia. Um, I don't mean to suggest that the Armenian genocide stopped until certainly the early 1920s, uh, but it was it, the, the SEV process and the arbitral award were certainly aimed at the earlier phases uh, of the genocide from 1915 on. Um, I also appreciate the distinction he made between the legal aspects of the treaty or the, the concept of the treaty as a legal document and its other dimensions, historical, political, and, and ethical. Um, the treaty itself was not ratified. Um, Ara Papian, who is a co-author of Resolution uh, with Justice, has done tremendous work in, in developing a, a very well-grounded um, well argument that the ratification or non-ratification of the Treaty of Sev does not mean that the arbitral award does not have legal implications today. That was a separate process that was part of the, the Sev negotiating process, but did not require um, the ratification of the Treaty of Sev um, to be legally binding. Um, and he uh, has, I think, very powerful arguments in that, in that direction. Um, that said, um, I, I take Professor Hovinessian, Hovinessian's uh, cynicism very seriously. I don't think it's cynicism, I would say it's realism. Um, and I will, I will comment as an aside that back maybe about seven or eight years ago, I had the foolish audacity to suggest that with all the advances that have been made in scholarship on the Armenian Genocide, the political shifts that were happening and so forth, that denial was a waning um, phenomenon, um, and that by 2015, that would it, it would not be a huge factor. Um, I certainly will will admit, uh, and and he immediately said, you know what? I think you're really underestimating the the staying power of denial and and the fact that that we may be in a in a positive swing now, but we'll see what the future holds. He was exactly right. His his uh, realistic understanding of the dynamics of denial were absolutely on target. And I think what we've seen even this year is, a, you know, an ever increasing and, and I would say even fanatical commitment by the Turkish government and, and its, uh, its various um, allies and servants and mercenaries um, to increase that push on denial yet again. Um, so with that in mind, I, I very much agree with him that we, we take a real naive view if we simply hold up the Treaty of Sev or even the Arbitral Award, which may have legal, um, you know, legal relevance today, and simply point to them and expect that to be our, our case for why Armenia deserves territory outside of its current borders based on that history. I think the reality is um, the treaty itself, uh, you know, has been superseded. I'm not talking legally, um, and the arbitral award as well, but by the reality of politics and actual boots on the ground military power um, in the region. Um, and so the, the, the past, uh, 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 I want to say theoretical or abstract um, Armenian Republic created through these documents is not, a, is not a, an obvious reality for today. It's not something we can just point to and claim should be, should be um, acted on uh, and expect political powers, legal entities, and so forth to take up that cause. That is not to say that it is, it is just that the, those lands that were, that were uh, supposed to be guaranteed to the arbitral award are not part of Armenia. They absolutely morally and legally should be, but that's a separate issue from the reality on the ground of politics and, and military power. Um, and let's not forget that part of what happens in the aftermath of World War I um, are dramatically shifting political uh, calculations. Um, we have the, 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 I won't say the beginnings, but certainly the, the great escalation of oil politics in the Middle East um, and if you read people like Christopher Simpson talking about the role of the U.S. and the Dulles Brothers and so forth in the 1920s in changing U.S. policy toward Turkey and, of course, by, by default towards Armenians and others, um, we see this very clearly. We also have, you know, the, the very clear tension with the now communist uh, Soviet Union, um, very different from the Russian Republic, which certainly had its tensions with 
with um, uh, you know, other European great powers. But a very different ideological, political, and economic battle come, comes to the fore in, in the late teens and 20s. And clearly, the, the view um, of Turkey changes dramatically. Um, you had the U.S. attitude toward Turkey and so forth changed dramatically. And unfortunately, the, those political realities certainly trumped any moral uh, uh, or even humanitarian compassionate concern for Armenians. So understanding that sort of gives us a sense of, of where we are. We should also understand just how meaningless, um, I would argue, treaties can be when they're not backed by enough power to enforce them, and especially when they're associated with genocidal processes and they're made on behalf of victims of genocide. If you look at the United States, um, we have actually, uh, uh, the number is more than 370 ratified treaties with Native American groups that were made uh, through the first century of our, of our existence as a country. And I believe the number is more than 500 that were signed. Some obviously were not ratified. Um, and anyone aware of the situation of Native Americans in the US today and land claims and so many other things knows that the, the bulk of the provisions of those treaties and, and the majority of the treaties have not been honored. That is the reality for victim groups. You may get something through um, a political and legal process, but the fact that you have undergone genocide usually means your position is very weak. You don't have the military, you don't have the numbers, you don't have the, the political uh, power, the identity cohesion and so forth to enforce your rights under those treaties. And Native American groups continue to this day to try to enforce basic treaty rights, even to the, the limited extent of using sites, not owning sites, but using their historically uh, historical land for religious practices. Um, so I think Armenians are, I will say, in good company um, with other groups who have experienced very similar uh, realities in, in, in the history of treaties after they were supposed to, to deal with the past genocide. That said, I also want to really appreciate what Professor Hovanesian said, that, that the fact that the Treaty of Sevres is not a, a legal document we can just point to and enforce easily, does not mean it is not relevant today. I would argue the opposite. The Treaty of Sevres, and particularly the Arbitral Award, um, and again, Professor Hovhannessian was exactly right, that the territory, territorial sort of map that was created through that process was done with extreme care, thought, and intent. And really what Wilson's team was trying to do was to come up with a geographical um, formulation for the land that would include um, resources, access to um, the sea, you know, for, for commerce and, and security, including understanding the existing um, uh, demographics of those lands, where for, uh, groups that would be um, hostile to Armenians were located and so forth. And to try to come up with a land formulation that would allow Armenians in the post-genocide era to actually rebuild, to be reconstituted as a people, and to have a chance at future long-term viability. Um, and we have to understand, while the word genocide had not yet been created, people understood at that time what had happened to the Armenians, this attempt at extermination. And this arbitral award was what I would, uh, I would consider a very direct attempt at reparations in its purest sense. That is, what repairs need to be made to the situation of Armenians to allow them to survive genocide. Um, and the fact that that, that process was set aside, um, while not surprising, in the fact that Turkey, you know, through its retained, you know, uh, significant military power, the changing geopolitical realities of the region and beyond, was able to uh, reassert itself as maybe the, uh, and a, or at least a dominant powerful regional uh, uh, state, um, you know, it is no surprise that the interests of Armenians would be set aside. Um, at the same time, we have to understand that that setting aside, that failure to honor um, the arbitral award 
has meant since that time that the issue of the Armenian genocide has remained completely open and unresolved. We certainly saw in 2009 with the Armenian Republic and Turkish Republic's attempt to, um, to negotiate the so-called protocols um, to come to an agreement that would sort of close the book on the genocide, particularly around territorial claims by the Armenian Republic. We saw very clearly that, I think many of us did, as evidence that the Armenian genocide issue, including territorial claims, was still open. Um, and I think when we look at, at this treaty process, along with our, our growing understanding about the importance of reparations as part of not just a justice process, but a restorative process for victim groups, when we put those things together, we understand that that initial paper uh, formulation of an Armenian Republic remains a very important ideal um, that has ethical and political relevance today. Um, just, to, just to push this a little bit further, the fact that that treaty and the arbitral award were not honored, were not put into force, did not have the reparative effect for Armenians that, that they, they were intended to have, and, and I agree with Professor Hovhannessian, were intended in a very uh, uncommitted way to have, uh, maybe uh, uh, were intended to pretend to have, maybe we can say. The fact that, that that process, that particular process didn't happen, along with the Paris, uh, you know, with the uh, um, Paris Peace Conference um, outlining of financial reparations for Armenians, which was again, never, never put into, into place either. The fact that those were, there, those were not implemented meant there, were, there was no reparative process for the Armenian genocide. Um, and to this day, there has you know, remained no significant process. The reality of that, and, and we have to understand that, has meant that in economic terms, in military terms, in political terms, in cultural slash identity cohesion terms, and by that I mean the, the difference between Turkey today with a, a cohesive national territory, large territory on which its identity can be preserved, celebrated, misrepresented uh, in all sorts of ways as we know, uh, and so forth, versus the dispersion of Armenians, um, as well as the folding of the, the rump Armenian Republic into the, into the Soviet Union, um, have meant even demographically and in terms of cultural identity, Armenians have, have, have um, struggled greatly and lost ground relative to a Turkey that has gained ground. In all those dimensions, Turkey not only benefited immediately through the genocide, through the expropriation of wealth, of, of um, power, and so forth, and Armenians not only lost at that time, but since that time, because there was no reparative process, that gap, that, that growing gap between Turkish identity power, political power, military power, territorial power, and Armenian has grown even starker. Um, this is the key reason why I remain an advocate for reparations today for the Armenian Genocide. Um, when we look at it in those terms and we recognize that this failure in the past has had an increasingly negative effect on Armenians to, uh, to the present day, we can see why revisiting the reparative process that the Treaty of Sev and the Arbitral Award should have been the, the foundation of is so crucial today. Um, I think anyone paying attention to the news with any concern about Armenian issues understands um, the, the recent attack by Azerbaijan on Armenia, the state of Armenia itself, let alone Artsakh, represents um, a number of very, very important existential questions and threats to Armenians. Not only is it just the, 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 the legacy of the failure of the kind of rehabilitative process um, inside of Turkey and in other anti-Armenian areas, including Azerbaijan, which may even be more anti-Armenian today than, than Turkey is as a, as a general population and government, um, that that failure of a reparative process that included those kinds of things, that recognized that, that there was a legitimate right of Armenia to exist as a state um, that was supposed to be guaranteed through the SEV process, that failure has, has made, it, um, made the, the opposite very clear. It has, it has um, 
embedded within Turkish society and, and state politics, and I believe Azerbaijan's, uh, uh, I, I will say state is a loose term, but, but uh, political powers, elites, and general population, a belief in the lack of legitimacy of an Armenian state. And that is why, that is a big part of why we see this, these brazen attempts that would never be tolerated against many other countries that are considered uh, completely legitimate, would never be tolerated, would never even happen. Um, that illegitimacy of Armenian statehood and territorial um, integrity, to, to, to use a term that um, Azerbaijan likes to throw around in a very different way, um, is very significant today. And I think I, you know, as an Armenian, I feel very worried about what the next few years are going to mean for Armenia in the face of an increasingly bellicose um, Azerbaijan and Turkey, an increasingly authoritarian. Azerbaijan has always been authoritarian, um, but that authoritarianism has has seemed to to, you know, overcome any kind of potential democratic opposition within the country. And we certainly know the last five years have been a, a, a complete, um, uh, well, I won't say complete, but large scale destruction of democratic countercurrents in Turkey. And in, in this situation, I worry, you know, for the future of Armenia. And I think the Treaty of Sev serves as a balancing point for us to refer to, to understand what was lost and what we need to be doing and what we need to be convincing the world community to be doing and to thinking about in terms of Armenian identity, territory, statehood, and so forth in the present era. I would add just two more, and, and uh, Dr. Kasparin, do I have a minute or two left? Is that okay? One? Okay. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to mention a couple other issues that we need to understand go with this loss of territory. The fact that the current Armenian Republic is much smaller than what was envisioned, not politically, but in terms of the viability of the Armenian people, uh, in terms of resources, in terms of territorial security, enough land for security, and so forth. And that are, are two issues that, that we see as important, but are often not connected very well to the genocide in this legacy. The first is emigration from Armenia. Certainly, corruption in Armenia, which we know has been rampant uh, throughout the, the post-Soviet period, as well as before, um, and certainly the legacy of, of the Soviet Union have, have had a, a significant role in driving emigration. But more importantly, the lack of resources that re have resulted from the genocidal expropriation of Armenian resources and the impoverish impoverishment of Armenians and all the burdens that have come with the legacy of the genocide, coupled with the lack of territory for Armenians to actually reestablish themselves um, as a viable uh, state entity and so social entity um, are important factors that continue to impact em emig emigration from Armenia today, which is a genuine existential threat in a number of ways. I think the other thing, many of you who are following sort of the, the internal issues in Armenia will, will be familiar with the Amalsar mine and the issues that have, have really forced Armenians today to grapple with threat of deep and permanent environmental destruction and, and a basic altering of the topography of the very limited land of the Armenia versus economic viability in the face of very difficult times, certainly made worse with, with the COVID epidemic. And when we start to understand why the Wilsonian Arbitral Award identified the lands that it did as crucial to the viability of Armenians and the fact that much less than that land is now what Armenians have access to, we start to understand this calculation um, that is going on uh, among Armenians um, in, in desperate ways of trying to exploit their land in these damaging, you know, potentially permanently devastating ways um, because they just don't have the land that they need um, for uh, safe extraction of natural resources for agriculture and for other purposes. So I want to leave with those ideas, um, but, but really to, to um, highlight just how relevant these issues remain um, to some of the most pressing issues uh, for Armenians and I think for the region and the globe today. I do want to end with one other thing to keep in mind. Um, the, paint, the background that I have on Zoom is actually a painting by my mother 
uh, who's a who's an artist who did a series in 2015 on genocide. This is one this is part of one of the the paintings. And as an Armenian, she's always been very committed to other groups as well. And the border of the painting is actually a listing of of uh, more than a, a couple dozen cases of genocide, along with the Armenian genocide that happened before and since. Um, and one of the points she makes in that painting, I think, is something we need to take from the Treaty of Sev. The fact that the Armenian genocide was not dealt with remained an open issue. And in fact, that through geopolitical and military maneuvering, the, the young Turk, I'm sorry, the, the early Republican movement and, and others were able to set aside a reparative process that had been very clearly committed to by, by the various great powers involved in World War I. Um, really opened the door. We know it opened the door to the, Holo uh, the Holocaust and, and Hitler's, you know, more general uh, destructive um, uh, process in Europe. Um, but it continues to be a lesson um, that we have seen again and again replayed, where victim groups have been, their interests have been set aside, their well-being has been set aside, and they have been left to languish in much the way that Armenians have. I'm going to close there and thank the, the indulgence of, of Professor Kasparian and others and look forward to having a discussion. Thank you very much, Henry, for a refreshing presentation. Uh, I'd like to move directly over to questions and answers. Uh, we have a number of interesting and even provocative questions. Most of them are uh, directed to both of you. So let me jump in and uh, we'll see where this goes. Uh, our first question is from Vahe Hairikian, who asks, uh, who, how, and when will take the responsibility to initiate a legal process to implement regaining the territories? A fairly broad question. Is there any takers? Well, uh, I don't want to be a taker, but um, it seems to me you have an Armenian state and an Armenian government. And um, despite all the difficulties and risks uh, legal and otherwise, ultimately, it is the state that must seek a solution with the support of a worldwide network of uh, organizations and intellectuals who might be able to help it. But I do believe that ultimately, if you have a sovereign state and you're going to go to any international body, it is that state that needs to initiate it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would agree on the importance of the Armenian Republic. And I think, you know, we know that in the past there was a great deal of reluctance. Um, maybe as we see, and I, and I have my own cynicism here, we see at least some increase in democratization in Armenia and a, and, and a, a much greater sense of civic activism um, uh, then, you know, we may see that that government's positions represent more accurately um, a broader segment of the Armenian community um, in, in the Republic. I also think, obviously, the diasporan uh, organizations and, and people in general, though, in a, in a more complicated way, also need to be part of this process. I think that's, you know, that, that is part of the legacy of genocide is the dispersion of Armenians so that the state, you know, while it may represent Armenians generally, certainly does not house even the, the majority of Armenians in the, in the world. I would also caution though, that a legal process would have to be part of a much broader and, and carefully strategized political and even public relations process. Um, I don't think a legal process on its own, as I said, is, is going to go anywhere. There is no way the International Court of Justice, which would be the authority that would have to deal with this, um, would ever, I, I think, even hear the case unless there were political pressure and movement even inside of Turkey to do that. Um, so I think any kind of legalities need to be part of a much bigger process. And I think ultimately the, the, the settlement of the Armenian genocide, dealing with the Armenian genocide, is going to be a political process and a popular process, not a, not a strictly legal one, um, for the reasons that we've talked about. Okay, moving on. Uh, question from Sevag uh, is the following. Can modern Turkey ask the U.S. and other signatory countries 
to announce a treaty of seven null and void. Again, oh, can, yeah. modern, can modern Turkey ask the U.S. and other signatory countries to declare the SEV Treaty null and void? Uh, Tur Turkey can ask anything it wants to ask, but um, the fact that um, no countries ratified uh, the Treaty of Sevra, uh, it would simply be a kind of reinforcement uh, for the Turkish authorities of their concern and fear uh, and me need means to block uh, further attention to the Armenian question. But anyone can ask. I would only add to that, that very helpful answer that um, I don't think Turkey wants to ask. I think, you know, people talk about the, you know, Tanrak Akşam, I think, uh, uh, sort of used this term first, the taboo of the Armenian genocide in Turkey. I think the real taboo is Sev. That's the, the thing that no one wants to open up. Um, and I don't think Turkey would ever want to open that in any way. It, it, is, it is very clearly, the government is very clearly on record that Luzon is even though that's not historically right, but Lausanne is the treaty that matters. Um, it superseded SEV, even though there are different signatories and it's a whole different process. Um, and there is no way they would want to actually ask someone because when you ask that question, um, given what happened in the US Congress um, last year, it is very possible that they might get the wrong answer. Um, and even though it might not have legal impact or political impact, that will still be a, a huge problem for Turkey. So I would think they would want to leave that question alone a, 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 as, as much as possible. Okay, our next question is from Vanugan, addressed to Dr. Terrio. Uh, when our day in court comes, which superpower, Russia or China, is more likely to support us? Furthermore, given that there is an apparent common interest in countering pan-Turkism, can you foresee Russia or China supporting us collaboratively? Um, I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that, that question. I'm definitely not an international relations expert, but what I would say is from an Armenian perspective, I would be very careful about um, ever thinking that any kind of great power support um, is what we think it is. I think we, you know, anyone who's looking at Russian policy towards Armenia and activities over the past 30 years um, is well aware that, that Russia's interests are Russia's interests and they are not in any way Armenian interests. Um, and, and, and I think that's important to understand. Um, I think, you know, China has very complicated uh, relationships with, with the Middle East, certainly, and, and other parts of the world, um, certainly with the Uyghur uh, issue that is now being uh, labeled at least proto-genocidal um, by the Chinese government against its very large Muslim minority. Um, it, it certainly, uh, you know, is not, not pro-Muslim um, power in the Middle East. Um, but that said, China's policies are its own. Um, if it can use Armenia, it would use Armenia, but that doesn't mean that it has any interest in, in promoting Armenian well-being um, beyond where those would coincide with its own interests. Um, so I, I would say we need to be very cautious of any power. I would say we need to, you know, Armenia needs to do the kind of smart political uh, relation building with many states um, and with groups or, or popular opinion within states to have any chance of, of a political impact of the kind of thing that you're talking about. Um, and then it, again, I don't think a court case related to Sev is, is, is a real, you know, is, is a, something that is going to happen in the foreseeable future unless the politics change significantly. Thank you. A uh, question from Nurhan Bejidian. Uh, uh, if Turkey were to accept to give some territory, what would be done with the population there? Professor Ovenesian, I don't know if you want to well, uh, why don't you go first this time? Yeah, so okay. <laughs> um, it's a it's a very tough question. Um, it's one of the one of the standard um, topics in discussions of reparations that involve territory. In any case, it happens. You know, we certainly see this with Native Americans and other groups as well. 
um, because obviously over a long period of time, demographics in a territory change, particularly when the point of a genocide was to, to eliminate the demographic of the, of the group who would get the territory, um, even if that was not completely realized. Um, I have argued uh, with my co-authors in Resolution with Justice that, is, that you would need a very complicated um, formula for adjusting territorial claims for present demographic realities without simply going um, uh, with a one-to-one -one demographic count. That is, be and that, that's simply because Armenians have very low numbers because of the genocide and because of what's happened since the genocide. Um, and so any kind of uh, proportionate use uh, uh, territorial award um, would, would, in essence, um, basically consolidate and reward Turkey for the genocide. Um, but very careful consideration needs to be given. Um, one question that, that remains is if I'm, a, uh, if I'm an average, maybe Kurdish uh, person in Turkey today, would I rather be a, a citizen in Armenia um, or be a subject in an Armenian controlled land or under Turkish governmental authority? Um, I have an answer to that. I think I would, I would take my chances with an Armenian government over a Turkish government any day at this point, given, given where the trajectory is. So we might ask people within those territories what their uh, preference would be. Um, but that also raises a lot of other questions. I mean, we could talk about this for hours once we go start talking about the, the particular politics of, of what would result from territorial changes. But those are just some quick answers to that, and I would defer to Professor Venetian to, to say more. Um, there's not much more to say. It's enormously complex. Not an easy answer to that. Uh, so many years have passed. The Kurds are now a majority in much of that territory, not all of it, not Erzurum, uh, but in other areas. Uh, they were the actual perpetrators largely of the genocide. They were the henchmen and the murderers of the Armenians, That now they're all in remorse and saying that they are now the victims. Um, but you know, the treaties, um, this was already an issue back at the time of, of, of the Wilsonian Award, because the Armenians had been expelled; they were killed; they were they were they were not there. How do you how do you create a state without people? And today, if the Palestinians have a case, it's only because they have a people there. And if they had been if they had left, if they had been driven out. Uh, one way or another by the Armenians, I doubt that there would be any kind of real uh, Palestinian case. So this is the complication of the Armenians. In various treaties, however, it was calculated that um, in a period of time there would be voluntary exchanges of population. And if we might take examples from other groups, one would say that here, if you come in with billions of dollars, you can buy them out and have them move to another place. And that takes billions of dollars. And I don't know where those are coming from. OK. Moving along, we have more questions um, from Rafi Krikorian. Uh, what are the chances of any territorial return versus simply political pressure for Turkey to exit the Karabakh issue with Azerbaijan? What was the latter part of the question? What are the chances of territorial restitution versus political pressure to get Turkey to exit from the Karabakh issue? Thank you, answer that. Um, well, one thing I would say is I, I really, uh, I think that's a great question because it, it, it shifts the, the topic of reparations and, and so forth away from some abstract sort of uh, uh, theoretical discussion to looking at the realities of Armenians uh, today. Um, and I think that, that that's really important. And it also puts reparations within a negotiative framework. And I don't mean that, that ethics should be negotiated, anything like that. 
But I do think, you know, that, that the Armenian genocide remains a very, very, very important um, historical, and I, and I hesitate to use this word, but bargaining chip, um, where if that can be used to save Armenian lives and, and to, to support the, the viability of Armenia, and we know Artsakh is not only historically Armenian, but it's crucial to the future of Armenians in, in the region as well then I think that's important. I think the one danger in presenting that as an either or is I think the whole issue around um, Artsakh and, and you know, really going back to the beginnings of the Soviet Union and, and Azerbaijani um, animosity, violence, and, and ultimately um, ethnic cleansing against Armenians is, is part of or, or has its, is a legacy of the Armenian genocide and, and the fact of a failure of reparations. Um, as, as I mentioned in my talk. And so I think we, we, we need to be very careful that we're not giving up one issue that in fact will undermine the ability to deal with the other issue. Um, and I think that's something of that was some of the logic behind the protocols in 2009, which was very misguided. Um, that is trading better diplomatic relations by giving up um, a, a, a historical right um, that would have actually weakened the ability of Armenians to have a, a good, you know, uh, have a good position in a relationship with Turkey. Okay. Um, allow me to proceed. Uh, we have a question from Steve Dedan. In certain ways, isn't the treaty uh, a recognition of the Armenian genocide and in a sense, Turkey's commitment to atone for it? Yes, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, it was indeed the fact that um, they are going to assist in the gathering of evidence and apprehension of war criminals, of finally getting the release of Armenian women and children held in uh, captivity, of annulling the uh, abandoned properties law. Uh, all of these are, um, as I mentioned, uh, the moralistic and strong statements that uh, sort of culminate the period of, um, of the genocide and acknowledgement of the genocide. I didn't think there was any question about that. Okay. Henry, would you like to add, or shall we move on? I, I concur. The, on, the only other thing I would say is it's not just the treaty or whether the treaty was ratified. It, it is all the discussions and documentation and, and so forth that went into the production of the treaty, which are official records that, that contributes, you know, to the, to the point that, that Professor Ovenessian was making, you know, of just how extensive an understanding of what happened to Armenians was and recognition of its wrongness. Okay, moving along, uh, we have a question from Arman Antonian. The current Armenian Republic does not demand any repar reparations from Turkey. Should it, and does that matter? That's a theory was a specialist. <laughs> well, I'm gonna actually refer to your son, Richard, if, if uh, you know, the, the um, very important political figure, Rafi Hovanesian, had really talked about that even you know a decade ago and more about um, about the importance of of the Armenian genocide as a part of Armenian foreign relations um, and and not in a naive way but I think a very sophisticated way that that not only structures the relationship with Turkey and I think the region in general um, but also remains a very important lever. In, in, in challenging Turkish attitudes and Azeri attitudes towards Armenians, challenging military threats and so forth. Um, so in that sense, it's it, it certainly not having it present um, as an important piece of, of, of um, the, the foreign policy of Armenia, I think is really significant. Um, I, I would also add that I think things are changing in Armenia. There, there have been efforts, um, you know, with some political support to open up the issue of reparations, and, and I'm somewhat optimistic that that, that will continue. 
Um, the, as a final point, the danger of not having that on the table is geopolitics can shift enormously. In 2018, I had no idea the US Congress that the relationship with Turkey would change so much that the US Congress would virtually unanimously recognize the Armenian genocide after how many decades, more, you know, half a century of, of such a refusal to do that. We have no idea what the, the next five years in the, in, in the region are gonna hold. And Turkey is a state with an authoritarian, even virtually totalitarian government in place now. It's altering its constitution. Um, there's incredible instability in the region. It is now military ag militarily aggressive outside its borders. And that can backfire in all sorts of ways. And, and without, Armenia needs to make sure that it is prepared and has claims on the table should the geopolitics and, and even um, state status of Turkey change. Okay, anything to add, Richard? Before no, no. Very good. Okay, we have a question from Berj R. Uh, as follows. From a strategic perspective, what propitious conditions need to develop under the recent geo geopolitical uh, context for us to expect Armenia and its allies to prepare themselves to revoke the Treaty of Karas and invoke the legal basis for adopting SEB? And if you'd like, I can repeat it. No, it's just that I don't have the answer to that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Henry, I always refer to Henry on such issues. No, no, no. I, I think it's a great <laughs> question. And uh, thank you for kicking that over here. Um, it's a great question. And, and I think we, we don't know. That's part of the unpredictability is we don't know what the complex constellation of factors would be. That would, that would open the door uh, to Armenian claims. And, and I think that's why you need to be prepared for different contingencies. Uh, I honestly can't predict what the Russian-Turkish relationship will be in six months. I, I, I can't, I know there, historically, I know what the sort of foundation of it is, but I have no idea um, what that relationship will look like even in six months. So I, I you know, couldn't even hazard a guess. Probably for the viewers, uh, a few who may, want clarification of the Treaty of Kars that was done in 1921 between um, the new government of Turkey, or that is Kemalist Turkey, and the three Soviet republics of the Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, whereby the current boundaries that exist now were accepted and um, uh, have become, since that time, the de facto border uh, between Turkey and the Caucasian states. Um, so. Okay. I think it's just, these are very complex, not complex questions. Questions are simple. To find an answer to these questions is far more difficult. The position of the Armenians is not a strong position. It is based on morality and ethics more than on power politics and we all know that uh, international relations is although there's a great deal of lip service to ethical issues, it is in fact uh, so-called perceived national interests. And uh, Professor Therio has pointed out the fact that Armenia is hurting from a point of view of demographics in that it's a country with less than three million people Whereas Istanbul by itself has more than a dozen, that is tw more than 12 million, maybe 13 million people in one city. And if you're an outsider looking in, you're saying, well, where do I have my interests more? Certainly not in a landlocked, small, dependent uh, country, except for acknowledging the historical fact. And you know, this is what Nikol Pashinyan, whether you approve of him or not, has stated uh, as something of a compromise that the Treaty of Sevra is a historical fact. That may be going farther than others would have gone, even though the position of the Armenian government has been and remains that there are no 
preconditions to the establishment of diplomatic relations with any country. Uh, and that, at least in silence, territorial issues are passed over. If, if I can add one small yeah. point, we, sh we should keep in mind that Russia does not need to offer much to Armenia to get Armenia to, to um, adhere to a, a pro-Russian line. And I think that's true of most, you know, most external countries. Armenia is not in a position to, to bargain for much. Um, and, and that's a real problem. I think actually the diaspora, if we look at US political power with Armenians, you know, have, have actually more bargaining power um, domestically in the US than, than Armenia does in its region. Um, and so that is that is a real problem. We can't, as, as Professor Ovenessian is saying, I mean, it's, a, it's a position of weakness where you, you know, people are going to use you as they're going to use you. Russia is not going to give anything more than it has to. Um, and no other country is either, including the U.S. You know, the morality doesn't get you very far. Yeah. Okay, we have time for maybe two or three more questions. Uh, we have a question directed uh, mainly to Henry Terrio from Andrea Mansurian. Uh, it's actually a lengthy question. I'm going to have to uh, uh, truncate it. Uh, namely, um, given the limited resources and uh, lack of resources due to history of genocide, is there a connection between Armenian identity and environmentalism? In the past, we can see a connection with the overall land, but how do we connect the past with notions of environmentalism and patriotism as Armenians today? Uh, this is a really interesting question, and thank you for, for reading it so carefully. Um, and, and I have uh, done some speaking on the Almosar uh, mine issue, chemical mining in general in Armenia, in relation to land, um, the future of land and, and what land represents. And just in a, in a sort of summary fashion, what I would say is land is not just a commodity. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned Native Americans in the past, and this has been a very similar kind of issue. If you look at Australian uh, indigenous peoples, Armenians, and, and, and many other groups, it's about specific land. We talk about Arara and so forth. You know, it's, it's about particular land. It's not any mountain, it's that mountain. It's not any area, it's this area that, that has historical meaning. And part of the importance of that is not just some kind of symbolic, uh, mystical attachment to some ancient land that we still have. It's really about that land serving as the foundation and the medium through which social relations and identity continue to exist for Armenians. Um, there, there isn't an Armenian who doesn't see a, a, a church a picture of a church on a, on a cliff top in Armenia without some sense of connection to this history. Even if you've never been there, you don't, you know, you don't have a, you don't know what church it is and, and so forth. And so I think in that sense, it's really important. I would argue, I've argued this in the case of Almosar, one of the really uh, frightening things for me about the chemical mining process, as well as regular strip mining and, and other forms of more traditional mining, are that they fundamentally and permanently alter um, the, the topography and geology and geography of, of the land. And in the case of Almosar, they will change the chemical makeup of, of the land forever. Um, and we have to ask if, if, you know, what that actually means, you know, it's a little bit, to me, the analogy is a little bit like kidney donation um, or kidney sales, right? That, that to be in a situation where you would have to fundamentally alter and destroy your own land out of, a, a, out of an attempt at economic survival tells us just how um, hard the situation of Armenians is in the same way that someone that, who would have to sell a kidney on the black market maybe to save their family from starvation. That is not something that's voluntary. That is not something that's healthy. It's not something that's good. It's something that's done out of desperation. Um, and I think that the impact of, of those kinds of environmental destructions on Armenia, I, I just, you know, it's destroying Armenia in a new way. And, and we have to be very, very careful about it. Um, I, I think there, um, one of the after effects of genocide is a sense of uh, history uh, and preservation of the Armenians. And I, what comes to mind immediately is that 
we love to go to Yerevan today and go to the Northern Boulevard with all its modern restaurants and so forth. But there was a strong, strong uh, resentment among the population when they tore down the old historic buildings of Yerevan, which was the connection of Armenians to their past. And uh, in the name of progress and corruption, um, much of ancient or old Yerevan uh, is gone today. And uh, perhaps they're be uh, better and prettier or more impressive uh, buildings, but the price for that is a connection. And there is a significant proportion of the population that uh, was uh, sensitive to that. Thank you. Uh, penultimate question from John Margirosian. What would be the attitude of the SEV Treaty signatories now? Any takers? What would be the attitude of the SEV Treaty signatories now? Well, uh, Henry can correct me, but I would say their attitude is it was a non-implemented treaty and a non-ratified treaty and that it was superseded by another treaty known as three years later, known as the Treaty of Lausanne, Treaties of Lausanne, uh, which set down the current boundaries of Turkey and did oblige it. Uh, you know, Lausanne does have some positive points did oblige it to acknowledge minority rights to education, cultural rights, religious rights, which have been frequently violated uh, in Turkey. We know that, but I expect that that would be the response is that we have renegotiated and we have come up with a new treaty um, on which our current relations are based with the Republic of Turkey. I, I think we should also, I think, I think you're right, Professor Obanese, and I think we should also notice um, that U.S. congressional action has never, you know, advocacy on Armenian issues has never tied anything specifically to the SEV Treaty that I'm aware of. That might be part of the discussions and, and the fact that the U.S. was a party to that treaty originally. Um, but the pa I, I, would, I would think that if the last year's um, resolution was linked to a decision, you know, for the U.S. Senate to reopen the Treaty of Sev. It never would have passed um, because that's a whole other, whole other set of issues. I would also argue that that there are no existing signatories to the Treaty of Sev. Um, you know, we're talking about a hundred years later. The geopolitics um, have changed in many ways. The the political uh, structures of the of the countries that that signed the treaty have changed. And to talk about the U.S. of 1920 and the U.S. of 2020, these are these are different countries. And so I think you know the country would not be want, want to be bound by something um, that it has no legal obligation to be bound by. Um, uh, as a, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> as a, as a piece of trivia, um, uh, the Lausanne Treaty was never ratified uh, in the United States that there was enough sufficient pro-Armenian sympathy in the Senate in the 1920s that the um, administration, um, was it Coolidge or Harding, uh, was unable to muster two thirds of the Senate. And so they, uh, American-Turkish relations had to be based on bilateral agreement as a presidential executive orders rather than through the legality of the Treaty of Lausanne that shows the sympathy that still existed in a significant portion of the American public uh, in the 1920s. Okay, one last question. I'm going to violate one of my own rules and allow a second question from Steve Dedean since it's a question that I myself wanted to ask. Uh, it's directed to Dr. Terrio. Uh, what response was there from Turkish academics to the reparations report that you published 10 years ago? 
Uh, it's a great question. Um, nothing, nothing significant in direct terms. However, if you look at both activists, um, and by activists, I mean, I'll say public intellectuals, Turkish public intellectuals and academics, there, there, there are many more today who will talk about reparations and, and who take it seriously. I don't know how many are willing to go to territorial reparations, but certainly substantial, meaningful reparations that show an obligation of Turkey to Armenia and Armenians uh, is there. I think of um, uh, Raghi Zarakalu is a, is a great example who um, had my jaw on the ground the first time I was on a panel with him many years ago where he opened the question in a much more forthright way than I had heard even many Armenians, including myself, open up on, on reparations from Turkey. Um, so there are many uh, Turkish people who are committed. I will say that when I did speak about this in Ankara in 2010 on a panel, uh, I, I, there, there were certainly the majority of academics, and, and this was the, after the first draft of the report was circulated, Certainly a majority of the academics there were, were um, cringing at the, at the mention of territorial reparations, um, but, but some were, were supportive and, and very clear that they felt that, that a meaningful reparations process needed to take place. And I think that percentage has shifted in a positive way, way since then. Of course, many of those people, and I don't mean to make light of this, many of those people are have been or, or are in jail and under threat to even raise these issues, I, I would say now. Um, but but there, there has been a response. I think, you know, there are people in Turkey who are taking this, this issue seriously. And if our report had some role in that, that's great. But I think the general trend has been to understand that some meaningful historical reckoning with Armenians needs to take place. Very good. Well, thank you both Henry Terrio and Richard Hovanesian for your excellent presentations and for this quite lively Q&A. Thank you both. Uh, this brings our program to its conclusion. Let me just make a few small announcements before I let you go. Uh, again, this uh, program is organized on the occasion of the centennial of the Treaty of Sev. Uh, and we envision uh, one further program later this fall involving a dialogue between Armenian and non-Armenian scholars on the broader significance or implications of SEV uh, 100 years later. So we will keep you posted. We've got your contact info and we will let you know about dates and panelists when that materializes. Um, I also, uh, once again, want to thank our panelists and our joint committee for putting together a fine program. If you've missed any of today's proceedings, you can search Facebook and YouTube starting this evening and use search term SEV Treaty Panel Discussion, and you will find uh, links that lead to today's program, both the Armenian language and this English language program. So with this, I thank you. Uh, we're going to lift uh, video and volume restrictions. If you'd like to mingle virtually, you're welcome. Thank you.